The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Lord, be on my mind, be on my lips, and in my heart. There was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus told them, Fill the jars with water. And so they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And so they took it. And when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, without knowing where it came from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely, an inferior one. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs at Cana in Galilee, and so revealed his glory, and his disciples began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Were you listening to the first reading? Can you remember some of the lines from the first reading? Here's the one I remember, and it's beautiful. As a young man marries a virgin, so your maker will marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so too will your God rejoice in you. God loves us. God longs for us to be in relationship with him like a lover. The gospel, a wedding scene. And Mary and Jesus and the disciples are there. And we hear that this is the first of Jesus' signs. The gospel of John has seven miracles referred to as signs because each of them reveal a deep mystery of our salvation in Christ Jesus, the gospel, the new and everlasting covenant. And this sign is rich. It happens on the seventh day. The Gospel of John begins identically to the book of Genesis in the beginning. And just as Genesis had seven days of creation, the Gospel of John delineates seven days. And in Genesis, the seventh day, what happens? God rests. And so too, in the Gospel of John, on the seventh day, God's rest that we're invited to is portrayed as a wedding, the wedding feast of heaven. And we're invited to enter into that feast. Have you been to a wedding? You don't have to raise your hand. Most everyone has. Aren't they usually a lot of fun? Aren't they usually beautiful? You see the example of two people pledging their life in faithful love to one another knowing it doesn't always work out for us humans. 
but then you enter into a big feast and you celebrate that. God is likening his love for us, which never fails, even though our human love can fail, as a husband and wife marrying. As a matter of fact, throughout the Gospel of John, this imagery is very consistent. The very next chapter, John the Baptist will baptize Jesus, as we heard last week, and then Jesus starts to baptize, and disciples come to John the Baptist and say, hey, he's baptizing too, and John answers this way, the bridegroom has the bride. Jesus is the bridegroom. His bride is the church, those he's baptizing. And then John the Baptist says, and the friend of the bridegroom, poor translation for the best man, is filled with joy. He must increase and I must decrease. Other places in the Gospel of John, like the water turned into wine, a sign of joy, Jesus expresses that his mission is filling him with joy to invite his disciples and the whole world into salvation. And John chapter 14 has a beautiful passage that we often hear at funerals, but it's really a wedding image. He says, In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, and I will go and prepare a place for you, and when it is ready, I will come back and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. In the time of Jesus, the way a wedding worked is a family would arrange for a young man to marry a woman. The families would work it out, and then the father would come to the bridegroom-to-be and say, you are to marry so-and-so. Go and propose and pay the dowry. The young man would go to the woman's family, propose to her, and if she accepted, work out the price or the dowry. Then he would come back to his father's house, where it may take years, and they would prepare a new house for him and his bride to live. In the meantime, the bride would be preparing herself for this wedding day. And then, at a time nobody knew, when the father determines that the house is ready and the boy is mature enough, he says, go and retrieve your bride. He goes and retrieves his bride, brings her back to his father's home. They consummate the marriage. I don't know what that really means. And then a wedding feast breaks out that sometimes lasts a whole week. This image is what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. God's only begotten Son was sent by the Father to betroth himself, to propose, to offer a new and everlasting covenant to us. And he laid down his life and paid the price on the cross, in love, consummating himself to us or totally giving himself body, soul, and spirit in faithful love to the very end. And God raised him up and he ascended into heaven and is preparing a place for us. But more so, before he died, he instituted the Eucharist, the sacrament in which he, through all time and space, continues to give us his body, soul, and divinity. And so we, after we've been baptized and accept that marriage with Christ, consummate ourselves to God through the Eucharist, where the two, body, soul, and spirit, become one. We receive in a very physical and real intimate way God's presence in us. And as two married couples are called to come together completely in love to one another, and the two become one flesh, so too we are united to Christ and become Christ-like, more loving by him living in us. We become members of the body of Christ, his bride washed clean of our sins by him and filled with the Holy Spirit. Second letter talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
There are many gifts given to build up this one body, and you heard knowledge and wisdom, tongues, healing, miracles, all very real gifts that we can and should pray for. But again, the greatest gift is to know God's love in our hearts in such a powerful way that just like a young man falling in love with a young woman or vice versa, you are moved so much that you desire nothing more but to pour out your love, life in love for each other. And so that is what we're called to do. Whether we're married, single, divorced, religious, priests, we all are, have the first marriage with God. And our human marriages and relationships only teach us how to give of ourselves so that we can learn how to love God more perfectly and allow God's love to transform us. And so all of us are called to continue to pursue that deepening love relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And like you would in a human relationship, it takes work, doesn't it? You can't just love somebody you do not know. You must get to know them, and so you date. St. Jerome tells us that the ignorance of Scripture is the ignorance of Christ. We get to know Christ first through meditating on the Scriptures, especially the Gospel, where Jesus is most completely revealed in Scripture. And in reading and praying those Gospels, we can truly encounter him. And then as we ask for the Holy Spirit, repent of our sins, that gift of God's love can enter our hearts and transform us. And then we change our lives according to the pattern we've been reading and learning about the person in those Gospels who has become real to us. And then we serve him through our life faithfully. And when we fail, we confess our sins and continue to do our best to faithfully serve him until our very end, when our life is finally poured out, consummated to God. And then we are taken up into the fullness of his kingdom, the wedding feast in heaven. But also, along the way, married people often, by the gift of God, have children. For love gives of itself and is fruitful. And so, too, in this journey, we're called to make children of God, new disciples, by sharing that love that has changed our life with others by our words, by our service, by our presence, by our witness, so that God's love may continue to grow through all time and space. And so... This Mass, as we meditate upon these words, let our hearts fall in love and renew that love with God as we come forward to receive this Eucharist, the sacrament of God's love, the consummation of that marriage we've made in our baptism. Let us give ourselves totally to him and ask for the Holy Spirit to fill us so that we may love him and serve others and produce more fruit in the kingdom of God.